Hello, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, some food for thought. We're devoting our entire show to food scarcity, food security, food innovation, and all the economic consequences. A new report puts a dollar value on good health and the environment and claims less meat eating could save the global economy one and a half trillion dollars. In Kenya, around 17 million people have no access to safe drinking water, but a vast underground reservoir in one of its driest areas was supposed to be a game changer. We'll look at the state of the water crisis in Kenya three years after that discovery. And spuds in space, why NASA is working with the International Potato Center in Peru, yes, there is an International Potato Center, to discover how to grow the vegetable on Mars. So, something a little different for you this week on Counting the Cost. One show on one topic, and that topic is food. Because it's just as important as any natural resource like oil, which we spend a lot of time talking about, but it doesn't get the same attention. So we're looking at the economics of food consumption and food security. Because while it's easy to say something like, we are what we eat, really what we consume is about us and the environment around us. Think about it. Is what's healthy for us healthy for the environment too? Are production methods cost effective or potentially counterproductive in the long term? These are all things considered in a report from the Oxford Martin Programme on the Future of Food. This is based at the University of Oxford in the UK. And it's come up with some pretty interesting estimates. Look at this. The programme found changes in diets could produce savings of $700 to $1,000 billion a year on healthcare. Simply cutting down meat consumption to within accepted health guidelines would cut emissions by nearly a third by the year 2050. A widespread switch to vegetarianism would cut emissions by nearly 63%, and a similar adoption of veganism would cut them by 70%. Now, how realistic such goals are is debatable, but the numbers do provide some insight into what change could be affected. So let's try to digest the massive agriculture and food production industry. It employs around a billion people, roughly a third of the global workforce. But look closer and you'll see that just a handful of multinationals actually control the products we consume. In fact, according to an Oxfam international survey a few years ago, it is exactly 10 companies. They are Nestle, Unilever, Coca-Cola, Mars, Kellogg's, Associated British Foods, Mondelez, which is formerly Kraft Foods, Danone, PepsiCo, and General Mills. Now, how many of those brands are in your fridge or your pantry cupboard? And did you know that if those big 10 companies were a nation, it would be the 25th most polluting country in the world? They also have huge advertising budgets, of course. And let's take a closer look, for example, at PepsiCo. It spends around $2 billion a year on advertising alone. And remember, not just soft drinks. PepsiCo's top snacks include Doritos, uh, Walker's Crisps, Quaker Oats, and Aquafina bottled water. So let's bring in now Dr. Marco Springman from the Oxford Martin Program on the Future of Food to discuss what these findings tell us. I guess, Marco, I want to start with the research that you've done because it seems to apply economic theories and models to food. Is that just because numbers make sense and you can quantify them? I, I don't really see how you can quantify food or at least quantify people's eating habits. Yeah, what we find important is to quantify really each step of the food system. So what we did in our research is we coupled uh, natural science models with social science models to quantify both the impact that climate change has on the crops, but also how uh, farmers and individuals react to changes in, cha uh, changes in uh, crop production and changes in prices, basically. As, as I read through your research here, though, it looks like there are some incredible gains to be made, but it would involve cutting down things like meat consumption. You know, you're talking here about what could happen under wider vegetarianism. Do you think, though, those scenarios are really possible? I mean, as we said, the numbers, the numbers you had speak with some logic, but, you know, I'm really not sure how many people would make those sorts of big changes. Yeah, of course, those changes are quite drastic. Uh, we wanted to look at them to scope, basically, the range of possible impacts that dietary changes could have. 
So basically by illustrating both the health and the environmental benefits of such changes and also putting a number on those, um, we basically open up the discussion to see if people find that a, a, a valuable proposal. And do they? I mean, have you gone further into the research like that? Yeah, I mean, you have to bear in mind that what we model is dietary change in 2050. So there are lots of questions that we would need to answer it from, uh, as in regards to how do we get from here to 2050 and what are the kinds of uh, incentives and frameworks that would enable us to basically transition from diets that we think we would have uh, in, in the future to more uh, healthy and, and environmentally sustainable diets. Okay, I want to move on with you, Marco, to some other food issues. And I know this is you know, a big umbrella term, but food security. This is a huge issue, potentially one you know, which could, well, we could, create, we could see battles and conflicts over things like food and water in the future. These could become, I think, issues that are that critical if they aren't already that critical, quite frankly. Yeah, well, what we find is really that we need to think a bit about the whole composition of the food system. So uh, as you mentioned, food security, the, the term is tossed around quite frequently. And what people usually understand uh, when hearing that is, oh, we need to produce more food. But actually, our research suggests that it's really uh, it's more important what you produce. So not all crops are created equal uh, mm. in, in that sense. So we really need to think about ways to ensure that people would have enough fruit and vegetables with, which, uh, which have health promoting uh, properties and maybe find ways to um, have a reasonable amount of, of red meat but not an excessive amount. Um, we've talked about people, we've talked about governments but a lot of people would actually say it's the corporates who really run the world in the end not the governments or the people and with the money and the advertising budgets they have that's potentially a huge fight there. Yeah, I don't see them so much ad, as an adversary. I mean, um, corporates react very much to frameworks that governments put in place. So once government decides to go for uh, regulation A and B, um, industry will adapt. And what industry is very good in is finding innovative ways of marketing their products. Uh, now, as a public health researcher, of course, you need to see that somewhat critical. but. Um, Without industries, um, we, we couldn't do much, really. So uh, we hope that also industries would think about maybe creative ways of um, basically marketing more health-promoting foods. And we see that in certain sectors already. Uh, and at the moment, that's actually where the growth really is, right? Dr. Marco Springman from the University of Oxford. Very interesting talking to you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And still ahead on this special edition of Counting the Cost, I get out and about here in Qatar where nearly 90% of our food is imported. But there's also some green shoots growing here in the desert. My chat with the CEO of Doha-based Hassad Food is coming up. But of course, we can't talk about food without talking about water. One doesn't exist without the other. And we've got an interesting story for you from Kenya where almost three years ago, vast underground water reservoirs were discovered in one of its hottest, driest and poorest regions. Around 17 million Kenyans lack access to safe water, so this discovery brought some hope to a region hit pretty hard by drought last year. But as Catherine Soy now reports from Turkana, the water's only coming drop by drop. For the first time in a year, it has rained in Turkana, northern Kenya. For a while, people will not have to walk long distances looking for water. But the rain here is fleeting and can mislead. It only rained for two days this time. Trukana is known as one of the driest and poorest regions in the country, but it's also rich with natural resources like oil and huge underground water reservoirs. This is one of four water aquifers discovered almost three years ago. It's not far from the administrative capital, Lodwa, the local government wants to use the water for irrigation and has sunk boreholes. This has changed my family's life. We now have water. We are farming. I can take care of my family. But that's about it. If you move farther away from the town, you come face to face with the struggles of those who live in the most remote areas. 
the largest aquifer with about 240 billion cubic meters of water, was discovered in Lotikipi at the border with South Sudan. Tests done on the underground water, however, found it's too salty to drink. There was so much excitement when this aquifer was discovered. Some people even moved closer to the water source. When we visited in 2013, they told us that their water problems were finally over. Now, not many people will talk about it. They're just frustrated. When we last spoke to Sarah Akadeli and her friends at a nearby village more than two years ago, they were so full of hope. But nothing much has changed for them. They tell us they still spend most of their days looking for water from dry riverbeds like this one. I just want the government to do something. When it doesn't rain, this waterbed completely dries up. And even if there's water, it's dirty. Dogs drink it, then we drink it. That's why our children are falling sick. Local officials say the underground water could be purified, but the process would be too expensive. We await to look for the solution of what to do with that water. Ours first is to capture the, the surface water that is running and the rainwater, so that at least there is an alternative assurance for a couple of months for, for, for the people and for the livestock. These women from Lotikipi say they want more action and less rhetoric. They've been doing this for decades, but they're cautiously holding on to hope that one day soon it will be easier to access clean, safer water for their families. Now, name a food which you need water to grow and then water to consume. Tea, of course. The famous leaf is synonymous with India, but two years of erratic weather has meant a decline in production, which of course has its own knock-on economic effects. Banu Bhatnaga has a story now from Assam in India's northeast. Acceptable. Good point. Meet a professional tea taster. Satyajit Hazarika's job is to assess quality, but, he says, tea is subjective. Like whiskey or wine, one man's drink is another man's poison. He says he's seen big changes in his 25-year career. The true growing conditions have become more challenging. Earlier in areas where you didn't need irrigation, today you need irrigation, so that's an added cost. The whole equilibrium is lost. Miridul Hazarika has devoted it his life to studying thing. tea. He it says global warming is having a serious effect on the industry. Climate change is impacting the productivity in terms of the distribution of crop to a great extent. And secondly, the climate change is also impacting the quality. There was a time when these sprinklers weren't needed, when the rainfall and sunshine were just right. But the tea plant is sensitive. Unlike annual crops, which dominate our food system, like corn, wheat and rice, tea is a perennial crop, which means it's grown all year round. You plant the saplings once and you can harvest the leaves for 50 or 60 years. But that makes it especially vulnerable to changes in temperature and water levels. Uh, flowers. A senior member of the Indian Tea Board and a fifth-generation tea planter says unpredictable rainfall has forced tea gardens to install irrigation. So we are completely dependent on nature and uh, without rain we cannot have uh, good harvesting. Irrigation will not uh, give you leaf, I mean you cannot uh, get uh, your production from uh, irrigation. It is only uh, from rain god, when, when there is rain, then only you get good harvest. Indians consume a third of all the tea produced in the world, nearly a billion tons every year. And millions who depend on it for their livelihood are looking anxiously at the crop, searching for a sign of two leaves and a bud. But do you think such a crop could grow here in the Middle East, in the desert? I have to say that, perhaps naively, I didn't think anything could really grow here. But it can, and it's part of a slow move towards a basic level of food security here in Qatar. Hassad Food is the company at the forefront. We went for a look around their farm and a chat about their future. The Middle East. It's hot and dusty and dry. Temperatures hit 45 degrees plus in the summer. 
there's very little sustained rainfall. Logic would dictate that growing food here is pretty much a non-starter. But then logic's a funny thing, isn't it? Because here I am, about 20 kilometres or so outside of Doha city centre, surrounded by these lovely lush green plants, growing food. In this case, uh, cherry tomatoes. There we go. Those beautiful, lovely things. And to give it the taste test as well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Very nice indeed it is. And you know they're growing all sorts here. Cucumbers uh, and beans sweet peppers, chili peppers as, as well. One of these is the hot one. It's not this one. It's only on a small scale, obviously, at this stage. But it is the beginnings of what Qatar hopes will be some real food security. Uh, nations cannot live without food anyway. It's similar to what we have. It's, it's like uh, uh, breathing. You cannot, you cannot live without food. Therefore, it is very crucial to have something like this. Although we know in Qatar, it's very clear that it is a very arid and very uh, harsh environment. Production cannot be done as any other uh, somewhere else. We have a, a very severe weather. We have a very bad soil. And we don't have that water. So it's not looking very good at this point, is it? It's so, not. So, uh, but technology can serve and technology can be imported. Mm. Therefore, uh, those Qatari investors lose the technology. Without technology, nobody can, uh, can produce in Qatar or a similar uh, environment like Qatar. You keep using the word investors and investment. Is this about investment or is it about food security? W or is it both? From, uh, it is both, anyway. But from local uh, Qatari investor, it is investment. From Qatari government perspective, it is investment and security. Mm. At what point? I guess what I'm saying is, does profit matter here? Because if you've got a lot of costs for maybe not so much uh, production, is, is the cost relevant here? Is it about building it up to a point where you do make some money or where you just want to get the food out there? No, Explain no, to no. me the it's business a, model. No, it's a matter of costs. Mm. How much how per meter, how much the cost of, 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 of that meter? Mm. And that meter, how much it will produce? And that kind of production, how much it will be sold to the market? Mm. It depends on the quality itself. So uh, let's assume that we produce a tomato as we do now in, in Shahania, mm. in this pilot project. So per square meter, we have to produce minimum 25 uh, kilogram. 25 kilograms of 20 tomato per, per square meter. If we produce less, then we are loss. Mm -hmm. Anything above this is, is, is profit. Mm -hmm. Now what we've done into uh, this exercise, we produced up to 32 mm -hmm. kilogram, which means that we are in a, in a, in a better shape. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've talked about tomatoes. What else are you growing? They are growing, we, in Qatar, we grow roses as well, mm -hmm. and other vegetables, green peppers, cucumbers, those uh, of which is related to the salads, because this is where we can control the temperature into the well, this Okay, so this is what I was going to ask you. Will you always be limited in what you can grow here, just because of the styles of growing, because of the weather, because sure, of sure. the water? Will you always be limited? Yes. I'm wondering how much you can grow this thing. Yes, we can produce all veg, all veg, and most of fruits, but no, no grains, no stable foods, mm -hmm. like no rice, mm -hmm. no barley, no wheat. These are uh, these kind of stable foods needs mass production. Mm -hmm. They need water, mm -hmm. and they need. This is not in the greenhouses. These are in the open fields, which cannot be produced in Qatar, definitely. Now, at some point reality kicks in. It gets to be 45, 50 degrees here in the summer. You can't grow food when it's that hot, except in a facility like this. It's completely climate controlled. There's water running underneath us. It's hydroponics, recirculated water as well, so environmentally friendly. And yeah, it's a little hot for me right now. It's about 30 degrees outside, feels warmer in here, but perfect for these tomato plants. Now, by the end of March, they'll be, well, three meters tall or so, ready for harvesting. And they tell me that if you can grow beef tomatoes in these conditions, you could go pretty much any vegetable. Do you envisage a time where, if we say that export is up here and cutlery made is down here, a, 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 t a period in time where you can close the gap significantly? Because I'm guessing if I go to a supermarket right now or a market here, the amount of cutlery grown things I'm gonna find is gonna be very, very small compared to the import. Sure. 
how long? I mean, you've only been going since 2008. Yeah. So, do you put a time frame on these sorts of things? Do you set there a goal is, like there that? There is no way we can say that we guarantee 100%. Hmm. No way. No, I, don't, no I, I, I way, wouldn't no think way. you would. But in, in our strategy, it is 60%. Okay. We are aiming 60% of, of Qatar local consumption mm -hmm. of a major product. Mm -hmm. And not every product goes well. So like we're talking about rice, we aim 60% of Qatari requirement that should be supplied by Hassad mm -hmm. or produced by Hassad anywhere. If Qatar select to buy it from Hassad, yes, Hassad will sell it. Mm -hmm. If Qatar or Qatari traders choose otherwise, it's his choice. Mm -hmm. The more I hear you talk, the more I wonder why all of this didn't start sooner. 2008 was only eight years ago, and if you're saying food is just so vital, why was there not more thinking on these lines earlier? Uh, before 2000, Qatar was not able to think of something different because we were thinking of gas and how to produce uh, the North Field gas and all those things. So the consultation was in something uh, far, far different than what we are thinking. Okay, I today. think you've made a very good point there because people would look at a, an economy like Qatar's and think solely oil and gas. And we're seeing the effect of that now with the price being so low. I mean, you would obviously advocate investing in what you do and investing in other things and making sure that the economy actually diversifies. And utilizing the funds which we've been created from the oil and gas. To, to, to go into the, and, and, and yes. is that being done? Yes. Yeah, you feel? That's the plan, yeah. yeah. That's the plan, and this is what, what has been implementing. Mm. What do you think about the future? How, I mean, w we use this blanket term of food security. What does food security mean in the end? It means, li it, it means life. Mm. I think it's the same as water and same as air. Nobody can live without water or air. And food, I think, is, is very crucial for everybody, for every mankind. Mm. And I think it, for generations to come, I think it will be a peril of, of, of live or die. Mm. And I think it, we could have seen you know, some uh, huge disputes based on food. I was going to say that because I've, I've read and I've, I've done stories in the past about the fact that people saying the next big war could actually be over water because there's so much issue. Food could be... Food is the same. Food is the same. Mm. Today we produce food in Australia or in, in, in Asia and we kind of export it to Qatar. Mm -hmm. But tomorrow other countries will, will think of the same. Mm. But while there'll undoubtedly be competition over food, collaboration will also be a key factor. Crops, of course, are on the front line when it comes to climate-related threats, and already some backup plans are in place. Like this one, a so-called doomsday seed vault constructed eight years ago deep in the Arctic wilderness. It's run by the Norwegians with the purpose of preserving the agricultural legacy of the world. Obviously, this is the ultimate save-it-for-a-rainy-day facility, but it has already been opened. Last year, seed samples were withdrawn, so researchers in war-torn Aleppo in Syria could continue their study at new facilities. And finally for you on this special food security edition of Counting the Cost, Martian potatoes. Not just an unusual thought, but an unusual partnership which is trying to make it happen. NASA has teamed up with the International Potato Center in Peru, bet you didn't know there was one of those, to develop a potato that could be grown on Mars. Mariana Sanchez reports now from the Atacama Desert. It's billions of years old, the oldest desert on Earth. This patch of the Atacama Desert in southern Peru even looks like it could be from another world. NASA scientist Julio Valdivia says, change the sky to orange and you are on Mars. We found here the closest similarity to the soil in Mars. We've done experiments like those done by missions that have gone to Mars. The organic matter, which is the base for life, is almost non-existent here. And that's why scientists from NASA and the International Potato Center believe it's the perfect soil to breed a potato that could grow in extreme conditions, as on Mars. The potato is an ideal candidate because it has conquered all the ecosystems on this planet since the Spaniards took them from here in the 16th century. Now there are more than 4,000 varieties in Peru. Researchers say the Martian atmosphere has high levels of carbon dioxide, which will help potatoes grow. Scientists and university students are collecting data and testing samples of the soil, which will be transported to Lima for the experiment. At the International Potato Center, researchers will build a greenhouse simulating Mars. 100 varieties have already been chosen for the experiment. 
They will not be genetically modified, but transformed by traditional breeding, pairing male and female plants to obtain a new variety, a new clone. We hope and we are sure it will be positive because potatoes have a high ability to adapt. Because the soil, the scenery, and the antiquity of this desert is the Earth's closest equivalent to Mars, scientists believe it's tremendously important for this and other experiments. However, they're worried that this place may be in danger of disappearing. Scientists want Peru's government to stop squatters who could destroy the soil. They say this land must be protected because if the experiment succeeds, a variety of new potatoes could grow anywhere and help ease world hunger. While growing potatoes on Mars may still be a long way off, at least now, it's not completely science fiction. And on that note, that's our show for this week. More for you online, though, at aljazeera.com slash ctc. That'll take you straight to our page with individual reports, links, and entire episodes for you to catch up on. You can also get in touch with us by tweeting me at KamalAJE. Do use the hashtag AJCTC when you do. Uh, or just drop us an email. Countingthecost at aljazeera.net is the address. That is it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Kamal Santa Maria from the whole team. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.